Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nishtat Zatoryan. I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. Our guest today was Musher Geberkian, the CEO and founder of Rumors Monitoring and DoWork.ai. We spoke about how his first company, Rumors Monitoring, provides insights into how companies are perceived across the media sphere. Then later on in the episode, Musher told us about the evolution of his latest company, DoWork.ai, and how it has pivoted over the last few years into an AI agent for customer service. Musher also shared with us his thoughts on how to build defensible businesses on top of LLM layers such as GPT. Thank you for listening. Musher, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Let's start with hearing a little bit about your journey. You're the founder of multiple startups at this point. So tell us what drew you to the world of tech entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, so actually, I started as a software engineer. So I've been in software development field for more than 20 years. So I used to work for international companies, mainly in North American market. And um, actually, this is where I kind of also learned a little bit entrepreneurship mm-hmm. because... I was not only in charge of like creating software, but also working uh, working with customers and uh, creating solutions from scratch from them. So this is where I really spend my time of understanding business needs, pain points, problems customers had, and try to find a solution for them. And then I can say accidentally, I founded my first startup, Rumors Monitoring. Uh, how it happened, actually, I was just, I wanted just to learn a new technology, so I created a mobile application, um, which was kind of a news reader application. And I did it with specific technology, so I can have some experience with it. And then um, I kind of wanted to monetize it. I wanted to get more users, and I started kind of learning how to do it and uh, applied for some pitch competitions. Uh, This is where I learned what is pitch deck, what is startup, and I realized that um, I'm very far from being business because it was just a technology for uh, it, it was just a product and um, yeah I, I started just learning and applying my learnings and at the end of the day I transformed this uh, mobile application into a big enterprise solution for PR professionals mm-hmm. helping them to uh, monitor their PR status in the market so basically I, what I learned that uh, it's always bad when you start from a technology. Not a it, problem. Not a problem, yeah. So that's why I, I went back. I started talking to people. I identified some needs, opportunities in the market, in the Armenian market. And I transformed my technology into a totally different thing. And, and this is how I started my first company, actually. As an engineer, was the realization that you had to begin putting on more of a business hat something that was hard for you to accept? Or was that something that you enjoyed? Was that exciting for you? Yeah, I think uh, I'm still enjoying most writing code. So, you still uh, get to write code these days? Sorry? Do you still get to write code these days? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I try to do it. <laughs> no, I do very uh, little now, but I immediately realized that, yes, I need to put more time on business, but I was not enjoying that part, definitely. As an engineer, you never enjoy it. Yeah. But you have to do in the beginning. Um, now in rumors like... I'm kind of not in charge anymore. In I'm kind of a high level uh, mm-hmm. position, and ev- everything is delegated. Mm-hmm. But in the beginning, I was in charge of everything, like starting from s- um, sales, even bringing printed invoices to the customer side because there were some bureaucratic companies writing code, doing the customer support, uh, pitching, talking to investor, everything. Yeah. And I think, yes, the rumors helped me to shift my mindset from being uh, kind of a just tech person to become more like entrepreneur and, and more business oriented person. So, yeah. But it was it was long journey. And, and as I said, like I'm still enjoying writing code. But yes, you need to do it as well. Yeah. But no regrets. When did you start rumors monitoring? Uh, officially, I can say I can say I started in 2015. So in 2014, uh, I, I was kind of playing with this model app, but uh, officially I started in 2015. Uh, then um, my co-founder joined me in the very beginning of, of the company. So initially we bootstrap the business. We found our first client through our network, um, which was a big bank in Armenia. I can't say the name. Uh, and it took some time to get the first customer actually. 
And then we realized that we are two, by the way, my co-founder is also like tech person, but, but he has more, I think, uh, business mindset than me, that we realized that we are, we created something for some field, we have no connections. Mm -hmm. So we decided, okay, we need to get there, we need to learn, and we need to uh, le learn this field and, and get to know people from mm -hmm. this field. And we started participating in different events and uh, going different like um, PR related events. Mm -hmm. and. And yeah, like actually we visited one kind of fun event. Uh, it was very interesting. We, it was just for fun, but we got like three customers from there. <laughs> yeah. And then we got more introductions from these customers. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is what I learned. You should be in the market. You should know, you should understand you know your, your market. So just building cool, great, great stuff is not enough. You really need to understand your customers. Yeah, yeah. I think that's some that's a realization that at some point every entrepreneur comes to. Uh, yeah. Especially yeah. engineering ones. Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what exactly does the rumors monitoring does. Yeah. So product? yeah, so basically um, every kind of organization has a PR department, right? And um, in order to understand where you are in terms of PR, you need to monitor the media to mm -hmm. understand what people or what media uh media's out are talking about you. And uh, initially, before rumors monitoring, let's say, in Armenia, and not only in Armenia, everything was done manually. So people were just looking different articles, reading manually, trying to search on different websites, finding some news and reading and analyzing and aggregating, doing everything manually, uh, which was obviously taking hours, days, and months. And now with rumors monitoring, it's like with a single click, you, you enter your keywords, and you immediately get all the mentions in the local media. And with another single click, you get a report, which before rumors monitoring used to take like days mm -hmm. to prepare. Now it takes uh, seconds. And also now with rumors monitoring, it's easy also to do competitive analysis to understand what your competitors do. So when you plan a PR campaign, you can first understand the current state, and then you can analyze the results of the campaign by this uh, monitoring. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically we built a platform that automates all the process and the main difference uh, of rumors monitoring uh, is that it's fully automated platform so we have no involvement in the process so there are some players in the market they do some kind of similar stuff but they are involved in the process while with rumors monitoring uh, because of also privacy uh, concerns uh, we just sell software with features and uh, our users are managing as they want mm -hmm. and we don't have information like what actually they are monitoring. Let's take the two use cases as you outlined as I understood as like um, both market analysis, how other companies are marketing themselves and looking after their image and also what people are saying about your your company, right? Um, right. On the second side, on what people are saying about your company, um, what are the metrics or the insights that uh, are gathered through your platform and how does that turn into something that's actionable? Yeah, so actually the main feature we have, so we do mainly kind of online media monitoring, so we don't do a full social media monitoring though. But we have a feature that allows to understand the engagement of any news article in, in social networks like Facebook. For example, you can get the top engaged articles and you can follow the shares on Facebook and read comments and everything there to analyze. Some of this process done manually, but the good thing that our uh, platform brings these results within a second, so you so can curate it. You can kind of order the articles based on we call it social score, so you can see even a trend uh, on a chart to understand when you had a peak, and you can go to that specific day and see what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we mix kind of this social data with traditional online media data. And this is, as a result, you, you get uh, what you want. How is it curated by importance? Like what are the weights that are given to uh, some piece of media? So we have a specific formula that uh, considers like how, how many times the news article uh, has been liked, commented or shared on social networks. And we have some formula that uh, adds these numbers together and, and we get a score. Mm -hmm. So uh, engagement. Yeah, so it's kind of engagement. Right. And and, um, and yeah, and, and basically you can just uh, select any predefined date you want or you can do it in real time and you'll get all the articles, let's say, ordered by engagement. So you can see which are, let, let's say, maybe you want to understand how was your PR campaign, right? And you want to understand which 
uh, let's say which media outlet uh, worked best for you. You can see which specific uh, publication went kind of viral mm -hmm. uh, by just looking to the score and then you can make decisions based on it. And the way the user decides what they want to curate is by keywords? Or? Yes, it's, it's mainly by keywords. We have very uh, rich uh, kind of uh, input where you can define like complex queries, not just like keywords, right. but you can define Boolean queries like by excluding or like including right. keywords, combination of the keywords with formulas and everything. So that's one of the competitive features we have. Mm -hmm. You can narrow down search as you want so you can get really like the data you need and not and, and, and just and not just the noise because our goal is to help our users to get exactly what they need and also the other future important feature we have because PR professionals they are not always let's say available right to to go to our platform so we have real time alerts it's very similar to google alert and in the beginning people were skeptic like saying hey like there there, there is google alert but actually the main difference that uh, rumors monitoring, uh, we have our own crawling and indexing system as Google does. Mm -hmm. So we index the data by ourselves and we crawl everything. While Google decides what to crawl and what not to crawl, right? Based on some crit criteria. But the thing in PR and especially now that there might be very new website with very low traffic, but somehow one publication can go viral on Facebook and you need to be aware of it, right? So that's why it's important that uh, Rumors has uh, the most coverage of the Armenian media. Mm -hmm. And also we can provide uh, real-time alerts. Uh, so by five minutes, you can get animations. With Google Alert, uh, it might take uh, hours or days, or even you might not get it because Google will consider this website not so important. Right, right. So real uh, alerts are also a very important feature our customers mm -hmm. love. I noticed on the website that uh, on your where you highlighted your customers, it seemed like most of them were Armenian organizations or companies. Was this tailored for the Armenian market? Or? Yeah, actually, we started from Armenian market, and um, so. We still have some international organizations, but they are kind of doing media monitoring in Armenia. Hmm. So we tailored it for uh, Armenian market. Now we are working, actually the team is working on a new newer version of the product to expand to actually to North America. So North it's a new phase for the rumors. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's tailored for, for Armenian market. Is entering a new market with a product like this, uh, is, a diff is what differentiates the markets, the sources that are relevant? that are important or? yeah so the thing is with media monitoring and similar platforms it's not easy to enter new market because um from day one even if you have only one customer you still need to cover the whole kind of um, media sphere me media sphere so it means it requires a lot of investment right, right. infrastructure investment so um so that's why we took our time to grow our revenue in armenia and uh, we bootstrapped the business actually we didn't uh, so involve uh, actually uh, one of our um, founders like third founder who is like kind of angel investor and co-founder put some small money and that's it but we uh, we were able to get to break even without uh, institutional funding mm -hmm. now we are considering institutional funding so we can go to the Expand globally. Uh, yeah because um, it requires a lot of infrastructure costs in the beginning, and also uh, the market is crowded globally. Mm -hmm. But with uh, with this new era of AI, we see new opportunities, uh, especially um, in the part where you enter your keywords. Now we want to change it, and instead of putting keywords, the platform will automatically identify use natural language to what content is relevant to you. So you don't need to think of about keywords and right. excluding and exclude including. So it will automatically, you just tell what you want to do and it will do it for you. So right. like kind of building a co-pilot for PR professionals. Right. That's interesting. That's like the new catchphrase, like co-pilot for this, co-pilot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It seems that's, yeah. that's going <laughs> to be the our future. <laughs> direction everything is going. Yeah. Yeah. I guess in a way, the platform is, is quite general in the sense that I can buy it and query whatever I want, right? It doesn't even have to be related to my... Yes, um, my company or my field, or right. It's right. like an advanced search engine for yeah, for the yeah. So we have we have actually we have uh, like the the segment of our customer are very different. Like we have comp like banks, we have restaurants, we have hospitals, we have governmental institutions, NGOs, and then 
obviously like the businesses brands they usually monitor themselves but ngos and international organizations they monitor events or different things so but yeah literally you are free to monitor whatever you want the only limitation for example how many f- keywords you can put yeah or do you have access to real-time updates or not or can you download report or not so kind of the packages are based on the features sure. and number number of keywords but you are free to change you are free to enter everything right right yeah and anybody can buy it like you know it doesn't have to be vetted or anybody can go online and sign up for it yes actually yes uh so anybody can kind of try it we used to have a even uh the the credit card payment option uh, but it turned out that in Armenia, we ended, ended up doing uh, more like contract-based um, sales. So usually we sign a contract and this is how you buy. But to try, everyone everyone can, everyone can try. try. Yeah. And we have, a, we have a great team that can help you with kind of learning how it works. We have a lot of materials. Uh, but yeah, like we are always available to show you, to help you to uh, get started. Mm-hmm. And then for the next step, it's usually like... A, kind of a discussion it turns into like a b2b so yeah it's, yeah it's now yeah like we wanted to we, tr- we actually experimented to do kind of b2c uh but then we realized that uh b2b is better mm-hmm. and, and and i think it was right decision yeah um earlier you said uh that you don't do full social media monitoring but it sounds like uh this, at least in terms of the sources and how you weight what piece of content is valuable to show or not does come from from social media yes. engagement. So yes. Can you explain the difference? Yeah. For example, at this moment on our platform, you can, for example, monitor a post from from uh, people from from user profiles on Facebook. Hmm. Uh, you can't you can't see like the post. Oh, made, okay. Uh, but uh, what you can see is like um, if you have a mention in any mm, publication from from media, uh, you can see how this publication was uh, kind of. Shared in the social media. Actually, we had this idea to do it, uh, but first, it like I think it, it was there was no demand. To be honest, it, from the first glance, it seems that yes, it's it's kind of something interesting. But then we realized that um, so first of all, in 2018, uh, Facebook introduced a lot of limitations on the APIs. So companies that do social media monitoring, they kind of do a lot of hacks. So we didn't want to do that, to do it, and we decided to focus on the um, on the traditional media. Now we are working on adding new channels like Telegram, for example. Hmm. So, but so far, yes, it was mainly like traditional media and how the how the publications is perceived on, uh, the, in, on the social media. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. And it's all the major. Like, I'm curious, does it include Reddit as well, or is it just uh, like the Facebooks and Twitters and stuff of the world? It's mainly uh, Facebook, Facebook. I can say. Mainly for, Facebook. From, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess in the Armenian context, especially yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. matters. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this wasn't enough yet to go start a second company, uh, do work. What prompted you to to become a multi-time founder? So. so the learning I had from rumors, and I think that's not only me. Uh, kind of statistic shows that when you start from Armenian market unfortunately then it's very difficult to expand to other markets Hmm. because armenian market is not repeatable like for example if you start in european country most probably the country next to you will be also applicable for you but armenian market is not repeatable so Hmm. when you want to expand your business from armenia to other markets it's kind of starting business from scratch Hmm. so if if you look also to armenian startups we we will notice this trend like Armenian startups that are successful in global terms, they started from global market day one. Especially the US. Yeah. Especially the US, yeah. And this is the most important learning I had during my journey in rumors. And uh, I started to work with this already in, in my mind that I'm going to start global. And by saying global, there's no global, obviously. Like you start from some country or uh, some market. So it was US. I started to work actually in 2020 when COVID hit <laughs> and um, uh, and I started, I incorporated the company in the US. So basically the work is a US company technically, mm-hmm. but the operations and everything still is from Armenia. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I know that the 
the product has pivoted and, and gone through its evolution throughout the year. So can you give us an idea of what do work looked like in 2020 when it was when it was starting out? Because I think it's yeah. a really interesting journey of how how yeah. products come to market, right? And yeah, I think uh, uh, I think I uh, probably did all possible mistakes uh, <laughs> that the founders do in do work. Uh, and it's good because now I'm done with mistakes. Right. No, no more left. <laughs> no, no more, no more left. Yeah. yeah. But um, initially, I started with, with yes, with a very uh, different uh, idea. So the initial idea of the work is to help companies, especially like software development companies, to predict the project estimates for the future projects based on the previous data with AI, obviously, mm -hmm. because. I used to do this project estimation when I was working many, many times mm -hmm. and I was spending a lot of time, not only me, like team of engineers uh, were working, uh, was working on, on like creating some estimates. Obviously, mm -hmm. estimates are never uh, close to reality, but still you kind of try to use your experience, your, your past data to predict or forecast sure. how long it will take, how much it will take to implement a project. And uh, so we had two main components in this product. One is a model, AI model, machine learning model, um, that basically predict, predicts the estimate, the number, and then there are some other, obviously, like uh, uh, calculations. And the second was uh, a model called language model that can really understand the context of the project, of the task. So basically, when human reads uh, requirements, uh, it, it under he, he or she understands, right, what, what's behind. Now we needed some model that can do the same, like read, let's say, the project description and understand mm -hmm. what is about it. And for this purpose, we trained our own language model. Just for your information, now it, we are in an era of large language models, sure. right? But for that time, language models are not something popular it was like Terra, and so we so. train our own one so now only big companies train large language models so basically because we failed to get accuracy for the first model for the estimation we realized that we need to pivot mm -hmm. so it was like technical risk so usually in an early age uh, in early stage sorry for startups uh, there are multiple risks right and technology is one of them and uh, so so seems i i was ahead of time mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something that um, is not doable now. Maybe I believe it will still be doable in the future. And also I saw the the change uh, in the market that uh, people and companies started doing more like, it's called like, uh, let's say, instead of doing fixed price project, doing like a, a kind of a variable a human uh, time and material. It's called time and material when you just... You still provide some estimates, but you charge your customer based on hours your team burn. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, you never deal at exact number or exact hour. Sure. It's called time limit. And, and I, we saw that companies, like big companies, are going in this direction. Uh, small ones still do the fixed cost, but like the big ones are the ones that will pay us, right? So that's why I realized, okay, we are good for the small ones, but small ones are not ready to pay as much as, as we need and the big ones are transitioning into, into this time and material approach mm -hmm. so we realized that um, yeah seems there is no market need mm -hmm. so and I decided that we need to pivot okay and then we, we we realized that something is happening in LLM world and I saw hey like we also have a language model so we kind of gained some expertise in this field let's let's pivot so I, I still had some runway so I could either you shut down shut down the company or try to pivot. And I think, um, I mean, most of the startups pivot. So this is kind of part of the game. Um, but uh, it took some time for us to understand what we want to do because uh, this time I wanted to make sure that I start from a problem. Mm -hmm. So what, what we did, we had this technology. We have the expertise with working with LLMs. So we realized that now it doesn't make sense to train your own language model because... Now they are obsolete. Like large language models replace all existing small language models. So basically what we did, we created a technology that uh, was allowing companies to connect their internal data to LLMs because the problem with LLM is trained on like public data. And when you want to ask a very specific question about your company, it most probably will hallucinate mm -hmm. because it's trained on a public data and it doesn't, doesn't know uh, anything about exactly about you. 
So we created the technology that uh, was allowing companies to kind of connect their internal data and get, let's say, ChatGPT for their data. Mm -hmm. But it was still technology, so we put it online and we started getting different users and we started monitoring to understand, okay, what they are connecting, what what the use case, what's the use case they are trying to accomplish. And you were using GPT, GPT's API? We were using different ones, like open source. We, we experimented with open source models. We experimented, experimented obviously, with... OpenAI, and also during this time we realized that um, for, I mean, I mean, you need to decide uh, whether you want to be a kind of a deep tech startup or you want to be, let's say, a B2B SaaS solution, right? So if you want to be deep tech startup and focus on, it's called like level one, which means like working with LLMs, working with developer tools that enables developers to, let's say, connect LLMs, etc. maybe it makes sense to experiment with open source. But if you want to build a product that uses the LLM, it really doesn't make sense to train your own model. So you need to use OpenAI for sure, I can say, to be fast, to be fast. Because uh, people think that if it's open source, it's free, but it's not. Like yeah, hosting and running this model, it, it, it costs a lot of money even we got accepted to intel program and intel is supporting us with gpus and everything but uh for small and medium uh enterprises so open ai we are not using the open ai native uh apis we are using the ones provided by microsoft by microsoft azure which which are more secure and you have more control rather than using the open ai but but the model is like same like gpt 3.5 or gpt 4 and yeah, basically, so we, we decided to focus on this and and be level to company, which is right. kind of creating the application layer on top of these LLMs. Right. What type of data were you guys seeing your users interact with? Like their proprietary data that they were connecting to your system? Yeah. So, um, so before answering that uh, to, the, to your question, like now we are focusing on a specific vertical. Mm -hmm. Initially, we were kind of horizontal. And right. we saw people were connecting internal company data, policies, some companies connected like even client data to analyze their client data. Some low firms even came to us. Uh, some companies were connecting their knowledge base uh, so they can use our technology to support their customers. So the use case is very different. And this is where we applied for uh, Berkeley Skydeck actually. It was back in May. We had this technology, we had these users, but we were kind of horizontal. Mm -hmm. And I knew that going horizontal will be hard. Like there are horizontal successful businesses. For example, Airtable is probably most famous one. Like Airtable is basically for everything. It's like, sure. but it's very hard to uh, build a horizontal uh, business. Uh, so uh, we applied and we got accepted to Berkeley Skydeck uh, your program. And we kind of use this time to understand what's the vertical we want to focus by obviously running interviews with customers. And you realize that from these use cases, the ones that have pain points behind is customer service. Okay. So companies are trying to create AI bots that can automate the customer um, service process. And we decided that we want to focus on this field because there is a pain point. Like yeah. Because it's cl clear that uh, for SMEs, hiring, maintaining, and scaling uh, customer service team is challenging mm -hmm. so now using do work um i guess a company can connect their knowledge base do work and then that generates a chatbot with which uh, the, the your customer can deploy and then their customers can interact with it to get customer service yes, yes yeah. exactly yeah good yeah. that's the kind of the minimum actually what it also capable to do so it can connect your knowledge base, it can connect your internal databases, internal uh, applications mm -hmm. to also use transaction data and also uh, and it can also make actions. Like mm. besides just uh, kind of running conversation with customers, it can automatically make actions. Let me bring very simple example. Let's say user, customer of our customer complains about some bug, right? Hey, I'm trying to do this and it doesn't work. Obviously in this case, the bot, the most can do is like, oh, we are sorry. I will let our technical team know right. and I will come back uh, when it's fixed. But here, what our AI agent is capable of doing, it can automatically, for example, open a ticket Take in up. Jura. So it, it, it's an end-to-end platform that covers the whole process. 
So when you put the do work, you know that whatever is needed will be done by the, this AI right. agent. You don't need now to go and analyze and or kind of read all this conversation to get insights because we also generate insights. Hmm. So like we show companies what are the questions uh, customers are asking so you can make data-driven decisions to improve your business. Right. Right. Yeah. The question that has been discussed probably since ChatGPT was released like 11 months ago and then subsequently the API was made available and people started building on top of it is um, often like the applications like this are referred to as an AI wrapper, uh, meaning that um, there's the GPT technology underneath and people can build businesses on top of it. Let's sit as sort of a wrapper around the technology underneath that's provided by OpenAI. The question becomes um, how to make this defensible. Um, you know, like when you're when you're describing uh, your your company and your product, it's easy and clear to see the value that it can provide a business. Um, but some some might also say that it's easy to replicate because the underlying technology at the end of the day is available to everyone. How do you think about building a business that's defensible in that sense? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, at the same time, I think it um, um, it's kind of there's nothing new. So actually the LLMs are like just technologies. Uh, like 10 years ago, um, let's say companies um, were using, for example, C Sharp or .NET as a technology to build web applications, right? Mm -hmm. Or PHP or, or I don't know, like C++ to build some low level applications. And, uh, and every developer technically could use it. I think you should consider LLMs as a technology hmm. because when you build a product, you still solve a customer problem. Right. And you solve in a very specific way that no other company does. This is where your value proposition is. Again, if you want to be a level one company, for example, if you want to compete with OpenAI, that's a different story. And there are companies that are competing. Besides Google, there are also and other companies the world yeah, so, yeah. that are competing, trying to build um, or train um, uh, uh, language models uh, but uh, I think LLMs are just technologies uh, and you need to consider them as technology and the startup's job is still to create a product that uh, kind of in a very solid way solves the customer problem mm -hmm. and uh, now we have a new normal but so every startup will compete in this new normal. And your job is still the same, to provide the best user experience that can solve that specific problem. And um, and yes, and, and now kind of you consider LLM as, as like C Sharp or .NET right. or like cloud uh, engine that uh, you are using, right? right because yeah. when, let's say, when, when cloud uh, engines introduce, like Microsoft Azure or AWS, um, before these companies were handling their servers by themselves. And it was expensive, and no, not everyone could start a company because it was very hard to uh, buy a server to run uh, your application. When cloud engines introduced, um, you could think, oh, now everyone can create a web application. How you can be def defensible if everyone can easily create and deploy application on Microsoft Azure, on AWS, and uh, make it accessible for the world, right? It's a very similar uh, situation. Now it's the same. Everyone can use LLM. Okay, but uh, LLM is just foundation. The, the value you will provide to your customer is where you need to uh, compete and you need to be defensible. And I think it's still the same yeah. task as it was before LLM. Honestly, that's the best answer I've heard to that question so far. And I've, I've tried asking it to a few guests over like the last eight or nine months. So that's a really interesting answer. And it kind of reminds me of the mobile era when there was a time when startups were considered like a, it's a mobile company. Um, whereas nowadays it's almost laughable to think of it that way because everything is either mobile yeah. first or at least has a mobile in integrated into it. With AI, I get in, the, in that way, AI kind of became commodified through these APIs. Like now it's just accessible to everybody. And even if you look at the Armenian startup ecosystem, companies that weren't quote unquote AI companies um, 10 months ago, now, uh, just because of the market demand, have integrated AI features into it. So it feels like every company or every startup, every piece of software moving forward, whenever reasonable, uh, will have AI components just in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I can say more. Uh, even not only startups, but even big corporations. Yeah. Like it's like everyone is even they are creating this new job, like AI specialist. That like prompt engineer. Like yeah, like every 
big corporates tries to incorporate AI in some way because they think if they don't do now, they will just uh, lose the competition. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I understand that it's a hype. Obviously, yeah. it, it will be gone, and uh, but but the LLMs will stay with us. Yeah. And um, yes, I think uh, I see that uh, almost every startup um, either tries to use LLM or create tools for mm -hmm. LLMs, let's say. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's true. Let me ask kind of a part two of the building a defensible um, AI wrapper company. GPT, ChatGPT specifically, as it's developed over the last year, has added more and more features. I think just a couple of days ago, now, as of a couple of days ago, now you can upload PDFs to it and interact with the PDF in that way. And it seems like since this is a source of revenue for OpenAI, it's in their interest to continue developing it as a product. But I guess there's also a line because they also you're also a customer of OpenAI's because you're buying their API from them. Um, so there's some line that they have to kind of play where they don't build so many features that their API becomes less attractive to uh, all these startups that are using it. But they also want to continue developing their product. How do you think about um, ChatGPT's development as a product interfering with these newfound AI companies? Or do you think it's not really something to worry about? Like one thing that you'll constantly see is people saying, after some feature will get rolled out on ChatGPT, a large group of people will start saying like, you know, I don't know, 500 startups just got wiped out today because now this exists, right? So how do you not become one of those startups that got wiped out because GPT added a feature? Um, yeah, I think ChatGPT is, um, I, I mean, I had a meeting with one of the, uh, that's from OpenAI, and they say like ChatGPT initially was an experiment, but now it's a product. It's a separate department in OpenAI, and they will obviously Continue. keep keep, keep uh, building it and improving and adding more features. Uh, I think also ChatGPT helps them because if you read the privacy and policy for the APIs, uh, there they are more restrictions on using the data to to train their models. While with ChatGPT, they can uh, use, for example, for the for the free version. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they can use every conversation to train. I think you can now explicitly yeah. uh, opt out if you are on a paid plan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, but I think they are also using ChatGPT really to to test a lot of stuff because when when they add a new feature, like immediately, a few million people are testing it. So it's a good tool for them to test their APIs at the same time to monetize and also um, create revenue. This is also one of the reasons why we decided not to stay vertical, because initially we had all these features like connecting PDF or uh, connecting your Google Drive or connecting different sources. And uh, we realized that, that this is something ChatGPT can do, mm -hmm. because it, if it can be easily solved by a vertical, sorry, hori uh, horizontal solution, then yes, ChatGPT most probably will do. so. But that's why we decided to focus on a vertical yeah. when there are very specific kind of uh, nuances you need to consider and uh, vertical solutions like uh, ChatGPT can solve. Mm -hmm. Let me bring an example. Like, let's say you are creating an accounting software. Uh, obviously, you can consider Excel, Microsoft Excel, as a potential competitor because, oh, Microsoft Excel is built by Microsoft. Uh, then most probably they will add a lot of features and um, and definitely it's a risk that they can overtake like uh, the market. But yet there are many successful uh, yeah, accounting uh, yeah. uh, uh, because Microsoft Excel is horizontal. It's not only for accounting. People, Excel, Google Sheet doesn't matter now. Like the difference uh, is not so big. Like people are using for many different use cases. Um, and um, sometimes people, when they have a pain point, they want a solution that's very easy to use and that that's that does the job for them. Sure. Like you don't need to go and configure and, and spend some time. Like that's that's the main difference with I think and this is the difference that ChatGPT will never do. Like it will be still a cool um, uh, generic solution to the different stuff with LLM. But for example, if you want to build a solution that helps, I don't know, like people uh, to, I don't know, like get some uh, legal advices. So probably you need a solution tailored for this use case. If you need a solution uh, that can uh, be kind of assistant, like healthcare assistant, definitely there will be another solution because it requires a lot of uh, efforts to 
first of all, kind of fine tune and adapt the solution. And the user experience is also very important. Like, it's not always that chat is uh, the one you need Best to have. Yeah. yeah, so you need to adjust the user experience. And I think user experience by itself is one of the one of the things startups should focus on most to, let's say, be competitive with ChatGPT mm -hmm. or with, in general, in this world. Because user experience uh, definitely can help you to, yeah. to compete. For sure. Uh, yeah. For example, like Slack. Like Slack basically didn't introduce uh, anything very new, right? Maybe they introduced this, the idea of channels, but they were groups before that. And yeah. I think Slack uh, was competing with HipChat from Atlassian, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. For that time, there was a uh, product called HipChat uh, owned by Atlassian. And they just took the market because of the good user experience. That's yeah. it, like simplified user experience. It's not always like this, obviously, but user experience is, is important to consider. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Let's go back to, to do work a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, so I, I believe you guys just finished uh, the Berkeley Skydeck yes. program, yeah. the European yes. uh, edition of it. How did that go for the company and where are you guys at now in your in your phase? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it was very kind of useful because we, we went through transformation mm -hmm. during this program. We joined in, in uh, May in Berkeley when we had this uh, technology and we didn't know what to do with it i mean uh, we even had paying customer to be honest like but we were still feeling that these are like fake signals like uh, and uh, fortunately we met a lot of great advisors that had similar experience telling that yes like we we had a similar company like even we, we were um like getting a few million uh, recurring revenue but eventually we failed because we didn't understand what problem we are solving mm. at the end of the day we we were a cool product, but uh, if you if if you would ask like, what's the problem you are solving, we couldn't answer. So I think from day one we got this feedback: l l yes, transform from technology to product. And uh, Berkeley Skydeck has a great network of advisors and mentors that are open to really work with you. Mm -hmm. And these are like experienced people. Obviously. Founder makes the decision, so you never should uh, wait that some advisor will just come and tell how you should do it. So you should be very kind of careful. Mm -hmm. It's always good to take feedback, but not follow the feedback. I think you should take the feedback and analyze and use it, but not just follow what they say. Do you have a formula on how you decide what to follow and what not to? Uh, I think um, I was w whenever I was getting feedback, you need to do this. Then I was just ignoring that, uh, but. If the feedback is, oh, like, I think it should be maybe like this because I did this and this happened, then you see, okay, some experience behind of it, you can use it. Hmm. There should be always kind of something behind of that feedback. Why? Why? Right. Like, And you should ask that question, why? And if, if you get an answer, then okay, maybe, uh, maybe you can... It's an interesting filter. Yeah. yeah, so it's very hard because you are working with very different people. And especially in European batch, you are working both with US and European people with different mindsets. Hmm. But still, it was very helpful for us. And we kind of, uh, now we graduated and now we have our MVP. We have our uh, first customers. Uh, we are under private beta yet. We will launch publicly uh, by end of the year. But hmm. now we know what problem we are solving. Yeah. Most importantly, we understand our market. We understand our competition. So and um and we are kind of also ready for our next round mm -hmm. yeah this is a super insightful conversation i really enjoyed uh especially hearing about how you think about building businesses on top of these llm layers to close it off give us where you hope to see do work in five years and it's hard because you guys are so young but still yeah uh, yeah like definitely uh i see do work as a unicorn mm -hmm. that's a that's we are working on definitely our vision is to build ai agent that can basically replace human. So companies will not need to hire customer reps to support their customers. That's it. Like we want to basically, in five years, we want to replace human with AI agent. For and customer I believe service. For customer service, especially. Not in general. Yeah, not in general, <laughs> for customer service. But at the same time, this will happen in other fields as well. At the same time, new positions will be created, even in customer service field. So by saying replace, we are replacing the position customer service rep position or customer service agent position. 
but still there will be more uh, like new jobs for people to do because it's very obvious like 20 years ago or 30 years ago there was no there was no like product manager sure, yeah. or like uh, even like i don't know devops specialist <laughs> job right yeah. now we have and we'll definitely get uh, new positions so but at least the this boring and uh, all these routine jobs uh, that, that that are done by customer reps will 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 be gone by the work yeah specifically in the field of customer reps do you if they're not being replaced they're being augmented in some way do you already envision how their job would be augmented what they would be doing instead yes uh so there is new uh, kind of a term called like conversation designer or like let's say this these are going to be people let's say software developer programs a software right these people will uh, program how the AI agent should behave. Just like a drag and drop thing to... Kind of, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I wish you a lot of luck with that, Mushev. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and hopefully you'll come back to give us some updates. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thank you.